Good morning. <laughs> it's good to be with everyone here and everyone online. And um, he's worthy, amen. All right, let's let's worship the King this morning. Shall be your anthem, your re- 
God, truly we welcome the Lord into this place this morning, and we welcome you here in this place this morning as well. What a joy it is to see you, see some new faces, and see some new masks. Praise God. Truly we welcome the Lord into this place What a morning. joy it is to be in the house of the and Lord this morning. And for you who... And Lord, just accept our worship this morning as we give praise and glory and honor to you. Lord, in everything we do this morning, we exalt you. We lift you up. Thank you, Lord. And we give you praise today. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bowed and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb.
is good isn't he and he is good all the time whether it's a difficult time or a good time he is still good it's awesome that 
the things we know doesn't change who God is. God is the same. How awesome. Welcome this morning, and welcome to you online that have joined us. It's so good to have you with us. It's a privilege to stand before you to bring you to a place of uh, corporate prayer. And, and uh, this morning, I want to bring us to, uh, out of 1 Timothy 2, 1 through uh, 4. Uh, the Apostle Paul, you know, the Bible is, is awesome. <laughs> it's so individual, so personal, and so corporate. It's, it's just great. And so Apostle Paul, even though he was writing in those times, he writes to us. And he says, therefore, I exhort you, he's talking to us, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. See, he's saying that when we pray for our leaders, then we can anticipate that there will be peace in that place in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. You know, as I was preparing for this morning, I was reminded that as believers, we carry the privilege and weight and responsibility to choose our president and our leaders. So I'd like you to join me in corporate prayer this morning in this area. Holy God, thank you for the privilege and responsibility of living in the United States of America. As we move into the election for our presidential leader, we come humbly before you, holy God. We come to you to seek divine wisdom and revelation through the power of the Holy Spirit that will lead us to choose the person that will release your will, God, into our nation and the world. Cause us, holy God, to take time to hear your heart and will. So we choose the man that will lead us in a way that we can continue to have the freedom to love and serve you, God. The freedom to speak, speak freely about you to others so we can truly be a nation of unity and peace for all people. Thank you, Holy God, for hearing our prayers. Thank you that you hear us in the powerful name of your son, Jesus, and we say yes and amen. Is this a wake-up call? Is God trying to reach us, warn us, call us back? The time to pray, to seek his face, may never come again. If we do not return now, we may pass the point of no return. God is calling, return to me and I will return to you. I will restore you and heal your land. The time is late. The return, the global day of repentance and prayer. It is time to return. This is Jonathan Kahn. We are standing at a critical moment in American and world history a moment that can seal the future for calamity or redemption. We've driven God out of our culture and we war against his ways. If we don't return to God, America's light will go out. 
The answer is revival, but we only have a limited window of time. So this is the announcing of the return, the National and Global Day of Prayer and Repentance, Saturday, September 26, 2020, 40 days from the election and on the 400th anniversary of the sailing of the Mayflower at America's dedication to God. Join me for a pivotal, sacred, and prophetic gathering on the National Mall, Washington, D.C. If you can't make it there, the return will be all over America. Gather in your states, your churches, your homes to pray for repentance, return, revival, and restoration. On the promise, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, I will hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. The return is for all of God's people, every denomination. And on board is everybody from Pat Robertson to Dr. Dobson, from Billy Graham's daughter, Ann Graham Lotz, to Martin Luther King's niece, Alveda King, and many, many more. Surrounding the day of the return will be the 10 ancient days of prayer and repentance, beginning with the Feast of Trumpets to Yom Kippur, September 18th to September 28th, to intensify our prayers and intercession for revival. And if you're outside America, join us on that day in your nation to pray not only for America, but for your nation and bring the return to your land. The return, September 26, 2020. Plan for it now. Spread the word in this video and go to the return website org. That's the return website org. The return begins now as you, me, and all of God's people not only pray for revival, but begin living in revival. It is time to seek the Lord. It's time to return. Praise God, I want to encourage you to engage with us. We are one of the areas or churches that are hosting that simulcast, and uh, that will be here on that Saturday. I believe for us, there's, I'm sure, some adjustments still with schedule uh, that they are going to be making, but uh, I believe it starts at 8 in the morning, and uh, we have various times of worship and prayer, uh, scripture reading, and, uh, and as we move through the day, I believe there's, there's a break for a short break for lunch, a short break for uh, dinner, which we'll do right here on site. And then um, in the evening, it's like a three-hour worship and prayer service. And uh, anyway, it's going to be an awesome time before the Lord. How many of you know it's important that we be praying for God's work? Amen. Amen. So I just want to encourage you to be looking this week. Uh, look to your um, calendars. They'll be coming in the mail. You'll see things posted on the website. There will also be some prayer guides and uh, just everything that you need to know. Uh, we will get that information out to you this week. Praise God. Also want to uh, encourage you, and Jesse and Nikki, we're getting closer and closer and closer. This new little baby, little baby boy, growing the congregation, and we like that. That is good. This Saturday, we are having a drive through shower for Jesse and Nikki, and uh, so we just encourage you to, uh, you can look again on our website, you can also look on Facebook, uh, there's information out there, we've emailed out to you also, uh, but between 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock on Saturday, you can drive through, we'll be set up right here at the entrance, and uh, uh, there's even going to be cake. That just brings everybody out, right? Yeah, food, you know, food with anything is always much better, right? Just, it's good, but yeah, we're going to have game. We're going to have a cake and drive through, and it's just going to be a wonderful, wonderful time. So uh, again, you can grab your information online, and uh, I tell you what, man, in this day we're just doing all kinds of things different, aren't we? Somebody said to me the other day, you know, we may do a bunch of these new things and find that we really like this, and uh, not go back to the old way of doing things. <laughs> so who knows? Oh, praise God. Uh, again, I want to encourage you, also our plans and uh, for this coming fall, we are right now looking and planning on our Wednesday nights to start back on the last Wednesday of September. I believe it is September 30th. I think I have that right. So you'll also be receiving information of that, men's Bible study, women's Bible study, uh, our kids' classes, also our youth department. And uh, so we are we're working fast trying to figure out you know, how to get everything in so we're all COVID friendly. But... Again, great opportunities. So we're excited about that. I told somebody the other day, I said, my car, I feel like I'm in a race car, and I feel like the back wheels are just spinning, and I'm just ready to take off. I just want to just go, 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 go. And uh, we are, uh, we're living in exciting days, and God has many great things that He desires to accomplish in and through our, our hearts and our lives. Praise God. Would you take your Bibles this morning? Would you please turn to the book of Genesis? Book of Genesis chapter 26. 
chapter 26. As you are turning there, I want to remind us this morning that you and I are agents. We are agents of change in this world that so desperately needs change. So desperately needs change. Redig those wells. I'm going to begin reading this morning, verse 15. If you would follow along with me, Genesis chapter 26. Scripture reads, Now the Philistines had stopped up the wells which his father's servants had dug in the day of Abraham his father, and they had filled them with earth. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. Then Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water, which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by names which his father had called them. Also Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, This water is ours. So he called the name of the well Isaac because they quarreled with him. Then they dug another well, and they quarreled over that one also, so he called it its name Sitna. And he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it, so he called its name Rehoboth, because he said, for now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. Fruitful in the land. How many want to be fruitful in the land? Amen. Father, we thank you this morning for this time that we have together in your word. Lord, tonight, today, Lord, this morning, Lord, I pray that you give us ears to hear and hearts to receive. Holy Spirit, we need you. We welcome you in this moment. We don't want to hear man's words. We want to hear God's word. Jesus, we don't desire for men to be glorified. We desire for you to be glorified. So, Lord, help us to not only hear the word, but, Lord, strengthen us and empower us to be doers of the word. Lord, that fruit might come forth that glorifies your name and advances your kingdom in all the earth. So, this end we pray in your precious name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You know, a well is not any good if it's stopped up or if it's dry. It's not beneficial to anyone. It doesn't bring forth life it doesn't assist us, it doesn't nourish us, it doesn't keep us, it doesn't bring forth again that life if it's stopped up and if it's dry. No value to anyone. My friends, when we think about our Christian walk and our Christian life, when we think about the day that we're living in and the need for the good news to go forth in great power and with great effect, I want you to know, unless there is a, if there's, excuse me, unless there is life flowing water coming forth from our lives, it will be to no avail. To be effective in God's harvest field, to be fruitful in and through our lives that we might please the Lord and accomplish His purpose here on earth, there must be a fresh flow of living water that comes forth from your life and from mine. I asked you a question this morning, and the question is this, are you thirsty? Do you have need for a refreshing? You know, as we go to the Scripture, we, we find the word water in Scripture many different times, but we find that, again, there's great significance as we look at what this water is speaking of, the significance of water. Scripture tells us about the washing of the Word, the washing of the water that comes through the Word of God. 
Scripture talks about you and I as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ being sanctified and cleansed by the washing of the water of the Word, that we might be presented to our groom, to Jesus, as the spotless, as the spotless bride, without wrinkle, without blemish. We also read in Scripture about water as salvation or, or water as eternal life. When we draw from the wells of salvation, understanding there's a spring that comes forth in our life because of God's working of His Holy Spirit in us. We also recognize Scripture likens water to the Spirit of God. Jesus had said to His followers that out of their hearts would flow rivers of living water. And right after that, He said, now this, He spoke but it had not yet come to pass. The Spirit had not been given to them. Then there's fountains. We see Scripture talking about fountains, fountains of living water, referring to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, recognizing that when we come into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, there is living water that we, that we partake of, again, that not only brings life, but then continues to sustain and lead us forth. Scripture mentions that there are those who forsake the fountains of living water. And we know as they are forsaken, we know that the end therein is death. Water. Water represents some very powerful things in the Scripture. But I want us to understand this morning as we're looking to the Scripture that, that wells, again, are no good if they're stopped up or, the dry, or they're dry. When we look to the Scripture, we read about wells that have gone dry. We read about wells that have been stopped up. How many of you know that in our present day, we have an enemy who loves to dry up wells, who loves to stop the free flow of fresh water that brings forth life? In fact, the Scripture tells us that the devil, the enemy, of our souls comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said of Himself that He came to bring life and to bring life more abundantly. So church, we must understand it's so important that we know without the free flow of water in and through our lives, there will not be life produced. We must have living water. How many of you would say it's your desire to please the Lord, to live for Jesus? Absolutely. I believe most everyone in this room, that would be your heart and, and your expression. I believe that you would also say that it is you desire for your life to impact others in a positive way, that you desire to make a difference for Jesus in this world. But I want you to know, my friends, we're not going to be effective in that call again without fresh flowing water. We need the wells of water. We need to redig the wells. We need to clean out the wells. Wells like prayer. We need to recognize the importance of prayer in our life again. And we need to redig those wells and allow there to be a, flea a free <laughs> flow of water in our lives. We need to be wholehearted in our commitment. We need to exercise self-discipline. We need to regularly study the Bible, the Word of God. We need to once again as the church not be afraid of but begin sharing the power that is available to us through the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Those wells need to be redug. Our hearts need to be renewed when it comes towards missions and evangelism. We need to have fresh vision. We need to have a fresh flow of the Holy Spirit in our life, of fresh water that His blessings might come forth. My friends, we need to as a church be comfortable with and not look at repentance as a negative word, but as a positive word and recognize that as we repent, as we surrender, as we yield, life will come forth. Life will come forth. We read this portion of Scripture about Isaac's life. Isaac is the son of Abraham. Most of us in this room, we know a lot about Abraham. We've talked a lot about Abraham, a great patriarch of the faith. But I want you to know that Isaac, his son, was also a man of God, and he lived for God in his time, in his generation. 
In fact, he had encounters with the Lord. And in those encounters, again, God met him and revealed himself to him. We come to the scripture and we come to, uh, again, this story. And it's important for us to understand what maybe some of those encounters were. Isaac was that child that was placed upon an altar that was tied to be sacrificed. God had spoke to his father Abraham and said, take Isaac up to the mountain and offer him there as a sacrifice. The young lad said to his father, you know, in recognition, do we have everything we need? Where is, where's, where's the lamb? Where's the sacrifice? And Abraham's word, prophetic words were, I will, (laughs) what? The Lord will provide. The Lord will provide the lamb. And God did just that. As the son was laid on the altar, God provided the ram that was caught in the thicket. I want you to think about being a young person and experiencing what Isaac experienced. Don't you think that situation and that encounter with God would have an impact on your life? It was not only a testing of Abraham's faith, but there was a personal encounter and experience that that affected Isaac's life forever. Even as a young adult or or even as an older adult, he would always remember that story, I'm sure, and even recount it to his children. If anybody would bring question to the God of Abraham, his father, he would have experience to share of how God made a way, how God provided the lamb, the sacrifice of his father's faith and now his faith. You know, Isaac saw God's hand in his marriage. Abraham had sent a servant to go out to get a wife for Isaac. And again, that servant connecting and believing and and asking and praying for the Lord's favor. And someone coming, and and as he laid it out before the Lord, the Lord provided Rebekah who came and, and again brought him water and also fed the animals that were there. And there's this miraculous encounter that he experiences. Do you think Isaac ever forgot that? (laughs) No way. He encountered God. My friends, if, if we look at our lives, we understand that it is the desire of our Heavenly Father for us not just to know Him mentally or to give a mental assent to His existence, but for us to experience Him in our personal lives to know Him experientially, not just to know His names as the Lord, our provider, but to experience Him as the Lord, our provider. So Isaac had encounter with the Lord, and and we come again here into this story that we read in Genesis chapter 26. And we, we find in this story that it takes place, the background is, you know, Abraham has died, and now Isaac and his his clan in the land, it's a time of famine. I think that's a very important thing to note in this passage of Scripture. It's a time of famine. You know, there are some people today who would look to the world situation. We would look to what's happening not just in our nation, but we would look to the brokenness that is all around us all about us. You know, my friends, we we drive around here, we drive around Salem, we we experience or we see homeless people, we experience people with mental illness, we experience people who are coming from broken relationships or broken homes, we experience people who are are bound by all kinds of addictions and bondages, Uh, we find people who have no hope, people who are confused, who have all kinds of anxiety, and and they're, they're longing for some kind of answer, but the truth is they're in a place of famine. And my friends, lest we, lest we separate ourselves from that situation, let's remember as we look statistically back to the United States of America and we even look to the church, we recognize that in many ways and in many places, the church has not moved forward, but the church has stepped back. 
And many would say when they look to the church today that the church is in a place of famine. And yes, I know God is moving by His Spirit and He's doing great things. And I am thankful for that. But I would say to you, my friends, the Lord's desire for you, the Lord's desire for His church, the Lord's desire in this world is that there would be a fresh flow of His Spirit, a fresh flow of water that would renew and bring forth life. Water is so important to life. As we move on with the story, we, we recognize that Isaac, he's, because of famine in the land, he's headed to Egypt. And so as he's headed with his caravan, as they get to Gerar, he, there, again, the Lord speaks to him and says, I don't want you to go to Egypt, I want you to settle in Gerar. So settle there, there's King, Ab King Abimelech is there. They settle in, God prospers Isaac. His cattle expand, his servants expand, the scripture says. He just becomes a very blessed and prosperous person. Well, King Abimelech, you know, in the scripture basically goes to him and he, and he says, Isaac, hey, 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 you've, you've become mightier than us and y you need to move. <laughs> you need to go to another area. And so Isaac, he does. He, he goes, but as he moves, he begins to open up those wells, those ancient wells that his father Abraham had opened up, that his father Abraham had dug. And it's interesting, as he goes to open these wells, there's, there's a little bit of a conflict because there are other herdsmen and people who, who again say, hey, wait a second, that's our water. Hey, that, that belongs to us. So he goes to another place and he redigs another well of his ancient father. Then another one. I do want you to know, my friends, thinking about this, the, the wells, those wells had to be redug because they were stopped up. They were filled in with earth. They were filled in by the Philistines, is what the Scripture says to us, who were enemies, right? They were an evil people against the people of God. Came against them many times. They went and they redug those wells. They rose up against them and said, hey, that's our well. I do want you to know this, my friends. Anytime that you, as a believer in Christ, go to redig a well or dig a new well, you can anticipate that there is an enemy who will desire to keep you from digging deep, from cleaning out that well, that there would be a fresh flow, a fresh flow of water that brings forth life. Have you ever had something in your life where maybe it's an area you're really desiring to, we know in Scripture, Scripture says we are overcomers through Christ Jesus our Lord, but it's there's maybe been an area of struggle or bondage or just a habit or something we're trying, and it's like we've been struggling to get rid of it. How many of you know as we, as we make a choice to press into God and to press into that fresh flow of water and to experience that liberty and that freedom and that healing in our own life, the enemy would love to come against us. And many times will come against us in a battle of the mind. Oftentimes, that battle is with truth. He will come and he will sow false seeds, false thoughts that would get us to deny the word of God, to deny the truth, and therefore continue to remain in a place of dryness or staleness when God has called us to life and life more abundantly. Isaac prospered greatly. He moved through the land, began to redig these wells. Servants began opening these wells one by one, but there was a challenge that came. And my friends, I want you to know again, when those challenges come, as we press in, how many of you know that the enemy would love nothing better than for you and I to remain complacent and not rise up and actually pray and fast and believe for God to heal our land. 
Uh, been there before, tried it before. Oh, that's just something old. Oh, that's just a tradition of the church. It's not something that we really need today. Is it really that important that I read my Bible? I heard this out of a pastor's mouth not very long ago. Just to, it, it just it totally took me back. But it was how it was the whole focus of the Word of God being not being for today. It it has no application for us today. How many of you know that's how the that's how the enemy works? Why? Because he does not want life to come forth. He wants those wells to remain, again, just covered over. He wants them to remain ineffective because he knows that when there is a life-giving flow of water that comes forth, everything changes. Everything changes. I love in the latter part of the scripture, you, you recognize as you go through the story that uh, eventually, Isaac and, and his men, they, they dug this well, and there was no challenge or conflict to the well. And again, he called it Rohaboth, meaning God has made room for him. God has made room for me. And then right following that in the verse of Scripture, it says, we shall be fruitful, Isaac's words, we shall be fruitful in the land. He recognized that if they had the free flow of water, again, they would be fruitful. And church, I want to say to you today, if we've got the free flow of water, the free flow of the Holy Spirit, if you and I experience the refreshing of God that He desires to bring upon us, if we redig the wells and let the water flow, we too will be fruitful in the land, the land of your family, the land of your finances, the land of our community, the land of this nation, the place of this world. Isaac knew, Isaac knew that the wells needed to be redug and there needed to be a fresh flow of water. It was not optional, it was a necessity. Church, do we think about that in our spiritual walk? Are there things about our spiritual walk? Are there different wells in our life that maybe we have allowed over time or because of circumstances or situation or even the lies or the philosophies of this world that we've allowed them to be filled with stones, with, with earth, with lesser things? Would it be that God would speak to us today and say, come on, church, come on, church, rise up, redig those wells and let the fresh water flow. It's exactly what you're thirsty for. It's exactly what you're hungry for. It's exactly what you need. And it will not only impact your life, but it will impact your world. Church, we need to understand that the fresh flowing water is not optional. It is not optional. How much do we love our families? How much do we love this land? Oh, no, no, no. I'm not putting a guilt trip on you. I'm not coming to bring condemnation to you because I don't, Jesus doesn't do that and I don't want to do that either. But my friends, we need a fresh baptism of love <laughs> that leads us to cry out and to strive for a fresh baptism with the Holy Spirit. That we might turn this world upside down as the disciples did. My friends, we travel this world, we look all about us, and we see the pain and we see the struggle and we see the brokenness, and you and I have the answer. And we see it as we look at Isaac's life. Redig the wells. Redig those wells. What might some of those wells be? Well, I'll say this, my friends. Repentance should not be a bad word. Right? Repentance should be something that we as the people of God are regularly doing as we have need. Repentance brings forth life. The study of God's Word brings forth life. Time in prayer and in worship in His presence brings forth life. Exercising forgiveness towards one another brings forth life. 
My friends, there are many wells in our lives, but I would say to you, we should examine our hearts before the Lord and see if there is any well that we have allowed the enemy to fill up through false thinking, through untruth, through wrong doctrine, through vain philosophies of this world, or simply because of our sin. My friends, I know that as we're faithful to respond to God's word and his desire for our life, if we seek him with all of our heart, we will find him. If we'll seek to redig the well, the water will come forth. And you and I, Bill, be refreshed and we will be nourished. We will be encouraged. We will be built up. We will be empowered. And everything changes. Everything changes. You know, we have seen and we have read about, probably read about is a better statement to say, many moves of God throughout history. And as we read about them and we go back and we listen to the stories, we discover that there was a group or a remnant or there were people who made a decision to redig wells that fresh water would come forth. There are people who sacrificed and, and they prayed and they fasted and they brought themselves into alignment with God's word. What God's word says as a priority became the priority of their life. And as they walked in obedience to those things, they found what they were looking for. And not only did it change their lives, but they ended up changing their world. Again, I say, when men and women seek the Lord with all their heart, he will be found by them. My friends, for you and I to be faithful to the call, for you and I to finish this work and bring in the good news to all of the world, for you and I to be faithful, we must have fresh water. Fresh water. Oh, church, is it our prayer? Will we make it our prayer that God would flood this earth, that He'd flood our lives, flood this earth with His glory? That's His desire in this day and hour. Again, Isaac knew without fresh water, they would die. Church, I say to us, without fresh water, we die. Without fresh water, have you ever been in a place where, where it's arid, where there is no life, where there's no fresh water flowing? those places where it's just, it's all diseased and it's just, it's horrible. That's not what God came to bring. I want to encourage you today and as we walk through this new series again about redigging those wells, open your heart to the Lord and, and allow Him to speak to you of maybe there are certain specific wells in your life that need to be redug. Maybe you've allowed the enemy, the Philistine of, of compromise, or, or you've allowed the, the Philistine of false worship or false doctrine or pride or selfishness or religious tradition. My friends, how many of you know religious tradition has gotten in the way of a lot of free-flowing water? When God talks in the Word about doing a new thing, God's about new things. And the church is not called to just ask for a cup of water. We're called to give a cup of cold water, right, in Jesus' name. But we're, we should be looking for a fresh outpouring, for a flood. We don't need just a cup, my friends. We need a tidal wave. We need a tsunami of fresh flowing water of God's Spirit in and through our lives. You know, we may be tempted to forsake our responsibility when it comes to redigging the wells. You know, we, we say, okay, so who redigs the wells? Our thought might lean towards, okay, Lord, Lord, open up the well. 
Lord, open up the well. But you see, my friends, here in this passage of Scripture, God already provided the water. The water was already given. At Calvary, through the resurrection of the dead, through the gift of the Holy Spirit, God's already given the water. We just need to redig the well. He didn't tell Isaac to go sit down under a tree and wait while he redug the well. God's already provided the water. Our responsibility is to redig. Clean it out so that we have fresh water. God has already made the provision. But we can't stop there because we also have responsibility, my friends, in stewardship with all that He's given us. He's given us our families. He's given us this community. He's given us this nation. My friends, do we want to see a fresh flow of water in our community? Do you want to see it in your home? Do you want to see it in this nation? Do you want to see God heal this land? Then our responsibility, the provision's there. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If the church will truly come into alignment and redig those wells, there will be a fresh flow of water. And life will come forth in great abundance. Again, this, the scripture declares it. 2 Chronicles 7.14 Our responsibility, if my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and sit under a tree and wait for me. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll heal from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. I say again, my friends, to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, I say it to my own heart, to my own life, if there is not a fresh flow of water, we will not see the life come forth. We must have water. It is a necessity. And my friends, if our wells, if our wells are dried up, if our wells have been filled in, they are of no value to us or anyone else around us. We've got to become more like Jesus. We've got to redig the wells and seek his face. And as we gather in this place and we move begin to move into this series, my question for this is would you would you join with me and would you make a decision today, a decision that says, yes, I am thirsty. <laughs> yes, I do see and recognize that in our day, whether it's in the church or in the family or in our lives individually, there has been dryness and, and there needs to be greater depth. I need to get down to the fresh water. There's maybe things in our lives we need to remove or we need to get rid of so that water can come forth. But today, make a decision that says, okay, God, I invite you and I welcome you. Lord, would you come and you, would you reveal to me what wells need to be rebuilt in my life? And let me go one step further, my friends. Not only did Isaac, not only did he reopen wells from his ancient father, but he dug new wells. And there are many of us in this room, probably all of us in this room, who need to, before the Lord, open our heart and recognize God wants to do a new thing in you and me. My Bible talks about, and so does yours, talks about a harvest and a move of God that is far greater than anything, super, anything prior to. I'm looking for that. There are people who have never experienced a move of God in their lifetime thus far. I'm talking about a mighty move, Shekinah glory, move of God that transforms communities, transforms lives, draws men to God in significant ways.
there are many people in the church who also have much more to experience in Christ, but you've got to be willing to dig a new well. What would God speak to your heart? What would he speak to my heart? I would say this, my friends, the Lord desires to bring forth from our life living water, rivers of living water so that our lives would be changed, so that we would be refreshed and renewed and restored and healed, but also that we would be carriers of that water to other people. That they would experience the love and the grace and the healing power of our incredible and amazing, amazing God. Truth is this, church. We have nothing to give from dry wells. We can't we, we can't win the world. We can't be effective in evangelism. We've got to have fresh vision. We've got to have fresh water if we're going to be effective in the harvest field. America's hope? America's hope is not found in politicians. America's hope is not found in earthly things. America's hope is found when the church of the Lord Jesus Christ recognizes that we don't have what we need and what it takes to finish this mission. And we begin to seek the Lord with all of our heart and redig old wells as well as new wells that God might flow through his people, empower his people. Just one little side thought and we're going to pray. Church, we need to start talking about amongst ourselves with the body of Christ. We need to start praying for one another. We need to start believing for a fresh baptism of his Holy Spirit. You know, for some of you in this room, um, it kind of might, when I say that, it might, it's like, uh, just makes you feel maybe a little uncomfortable. I want you to know, you know, the first time I heard about the baptism with the Holy Spirit, I was extremely uncomfortable. I was nervous. Oh, but I'm going to tell you, <laughs> oh my goodness. When I was immersed in His Spirit, the transformation that came to my life was amazing. The confidence and the boldness and the giftings that came forth were amazing. And it was not a one-time experience for I found that as I continued to keep coming before him, he just kept filling and filling and still today just fills and fills and fills. Fresh water. Would you just join me right now? Would you just, would you just lift your hands to the Lord and just say, God, here I am. Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm thirsty. Lord, I'm thirsty. You may not even know exactly why you're thirsty, but you just, you know you're thirsty. Would you just... Call out his name. Just say, Jesus, I'm thirsty. Bring that invitation. Jesus, we're thirsty. Lord, we're thirsty for more of you. Lord, we don't have, Lord, all of what we need. We are thirsty, oh Lord Jesus. Right now, would you just stand to your feet this morning? Just stand to your feet. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, just bring expression from your heart. Let it just come from your heart. Just begin, just begin to worship him. Begin to thank him. Begin to praise him. Just declare your need. God, I, I need more of you. God, I know I need more of you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. A few weeks ago, I had a young lady. She was here at the church, and she was rocking around the building, looking 
for a place to get in and then finally found us in the office and and she came in and she needed Jesus. I'll tell you what, she came in so heavy hearted. She was anxious. The weight that she was carrying was overwhelming. As I shared Jesus with her, as I shared the good news with her, I asked her if, if she was ready to receive that life, if she was ready to invite Jesus into her heart and life. And, well, I mean, she was ready. She was ready. But I remember as I led her in that prayer and as we prayed that prayer, when we were finished, it, you, could, you could physically see the weight that had been removed from her life. You could see the, you could see the, the, the anxiety that it was there gone. You could see the troubleness, the confusion gone. And there was a peace that resided in her. There was a refreshing that came in that moment. And when you think back to your moment and your time of salvation, you remember that refreshing. When you think about those times where you repented before the Lord and because you were, you were in, in, in sin, you remember that refreshing that came forth. I want you to know that what God desires to bring in this day and in this hour and in this time is far greater. Much like, but far greater. God desires to do such God-sized things in and through your life and in through His church. It would blow your mind. But we can't do it in our own strength and power. It has got to be the working of His Spirit in and through our lives. So how do we tap into that? You take the spiritual tools, man. You start, start uncovering that well. Start removing the rocks and the debris. Debris. Just one more time. Father, right now, for every hand lifted, Lord, every heart is lifted before you today. Jesus, we just call upon you and we just say, Lord, we need a fresh touch, Lord. We need a fresh infilling. Lord, we're so tired of earthly things. Lord, we're, we're so tired of, of the compromises or the anxieties, or Lord, the, the fears, things, Lord, that we've allowed to stop up our wells. And, and I pray, Lord Jesus, that this week, Lord, that today, this week, Lord, there would just be that renewed heart and division and passion, Lord, to seek your face, to seek hard after you, that, Lord, we would find you in all that you have already provided for us. So, Lord, speak to our hearts. Show us, Lord, show us now and in the weeks to come, Lord, how you would have us to respond and what you would have us to do as we seek for a fresh flow of the water of life, fresh flow of your Holy Spirit in and through our lives. It's to this end we pray. Give you glory and praise. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Good things on the horizon, my friends. There are good things on the horizon. We serve an amazing God. Pastor Ted, would you come? I want to encourage you. Take, if you don't already, would you take some time to journal? I love journaling. It is like my thing, but it should be everybody's thing, I really think. I'm fully convinced of that. As you're listening to God speak to you throughout this day, even this morning, throughout this week, maybe there's certain things He starts talking to you about with the well. Write it down. Write it down and then start praying about it and listening for the voice of the Holy Spirit. God's going to give us keys and He's going to show us specific things that we can take care of in His name, that we can remove in His name. And he's going to show us how to move forward in his power and might. Amen.